Well, good to see everybody this weekend. How y'all feeling this weekend? You look good. You look great. You look great joining us online. Kempsville, Western Branch, everybody looking so good this weekend. And it's important that you look good when you're getting ready to go out and tell people about Jesus. Did you know that? I want you to know why the month of love is so important to us and why we're even taking this whole weekend to talk a little bit about what it means is because people who know you're a follower of Jesus Christ, they decide their opinion about Jesus by you, which means the most important thing you can do is love them. Did you know that? Every one of us here today, the most important thing we can do with our life is love other people with God's love that he's put inside of us. And that is truly what will change our city. We're going to talk about that, and I'm really looking forward to this weekend and gearing up. Uh, you saw it, specifically Western Branch Campus. I want to encourage you, be water baptized next weekend. Uh, sign up today, Western Branch, before you leave Kempsville Campus. We've got a water baptism coming soon. If you've not been water baptized, I encourage you, sign up today and be ready for that uh, because it is a great, great experience in your life. And I believe with everything inside of me that it's one of those steps that you never forget in what God is doing. Let's pray and get ready for what God wants to show us today. Jesus, we are so grateful that we get to come to you and, uh, and really just open ourselves up for what you would have for us. I pray today that you would speak through me. Lord, not, not words that, that I have, but I pray, God, exactly what you want each and every one of us to hear today. Let us be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In John chapter 13, Jesus made a very bold statement. He said, dear children, I'll be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, some of you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Everybody say new. new. Love each other. Ju you just want to keep repeating at Western Branch. <laughs> just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now it's interesting to note that that. In the original language, when this word says new, it didn't mean actually new as in never existing. It meant a freshness. Jesus was like, here's a fresh new perspective a little bit. Here's a, here's a fresh new idea for you. You really need to start loving other people. You really need to start loving other people. And I love what it says at the end of verse 35, is it will prove to other people that you're a follower of Jesus. If you're here today, if you're listening today and you're a follower of Jesus, I, I have been asking myself this question, what does my love prove? What does my love for others prove? What does it, what does it show? Because we live in an era of human history where social justice or doing good things is popular. It hasn't always been the case, but it is right now. And it is important to do those things. I spoke on Vision Weekend here that an empty stomach is a problem. And we as a church, as individuals, corporately, we're doing something about that. We feed the homeless. We go to those who are in need and just down on their luck for a season of time. And we provide as part of a church and serving. But other people can just do that also. The church should, but other people do also. Jesus said there would be something more. There would be something, something more when it came from him. And I would offer today as we begin to kind of think about it and walk through it is it would be deep from our hearts. But the question all of us have got to start thinking about is what does our love prove? What does it prove? We've been in a series for the past three weeks called Tribe. This weekend is, is the completion of this four weekend message series. And the reason I'm ending on this is because when a, when a tribe of thousands, as we are as a church, decides to deploy on a whole region with the love that Jesus talks about in John chapter 13, that others would know him by the way we love. I am telling you here today, a whole region changes. That within one month, I believe there could be changes in Hampton Roads. Legitimately, tens of thousands of people could give their life to Jesus Christ in the next month all around Hampton Roads because of what the people of Community Church do. Can, could you get that? Like some of you are like, well, whatever. I'm just really. We, we have to understand why our life is so important. You know, some of us here today, we're hurting. A lot of us are hurting for different reasons. But did you know that sometimes the best thing you can do to heal your hurt 
is to let God use you to heal somebody else's. That can be the best thing you can do. Sometimes, you might want to write this down, it's not going to be on the screens, but it could change your life. Sometimes the best thing you can do to heal your own hurt is to let God use you to heal someone else's. That's the promise of, of loving like Jesus. See, when we love like Jesus, if you are taking notes, you do have a blank for this this weekend. When we love like Jesus, it equals positive change. Loving like Jesus equals positive change. Positive change. So we're a tribe as a church called to go love like Jesus. And that can be something that sounds uh, glamorous pie in the sky. That can be something that means we're supposed to go do some amazing things. That's something that starts right where we live. Right where we live, loving like Jesus starts in our neighborhoods. When we start to talk about neighborhoods or think about neighborhoods, that, that becomes interesting because the whole concept of having a neighbor depending on who you are today, where you live, it means all kinds of thoughts in your mind. Some of you come to church with your neighbor. Some of you do everything you can to avoid your neighbor. Some of you do everything you can to avoid your neighbor and you see them at church. And this creates a problem for you. And this message will be a little bit difficult for you because, because you're not real sure what to do. Loving like Jesus It's crazy radical because in Matthew 20, here's how he loves it, says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom. Jesus said, this is why I came to the earth. Jesus walked on the earth, lived fully as man while fully as God at the same time. And he just loved others, gave his life up. And he looks at me and you and he asks us the question, he'd be like, are you willing to really love people like this? Are you willing to really do this? And this is, I'm preaching this message this weekend knowing it's Bible and that it's true and talking to you going, it's hard for me. It's hard for me. Because sometimes, you know, you just don't really necessarily feel like loving people. Or what a lot of, what a lot of experience has been for our culture of church people when they're told to like love their neighbors and go out and do good things is they just try to convert them. I, I love what, what one of our uh, uh, owners was telling me this past weekend of, of a boss of his that is, is, uh, is not a follower of Jesus Christ, um, and he, he has no real experience, and, and he legitimately believes that what Christians try to do is just thump people on the head and convert them to Christianity. And some of you believe that too, and you believe that's all church was about until you came to community church and you realize, no, it's about loving God and loving people. Because when you do that, people actually do come to give their life to Jesus Christ. What does your love, what does your love prove? What do your neighbors think about you? I'm sure many of you today have experienced, at least if you've lived in America for very long, you've experienced some people on a Saturday morning walking through your neighborhood in suits. with some brochures, <laughs> potentially, that could change your life. And a lot of people have that idea of what it means to love your neighbors. That's not loving your neighbors. That's not loving your neighbors. Loving your neighbors is getting in their life and actually caring about them. Loving your neighbors is actually serving in a way that makes a difference. It means we actually get out of our comfort zones and into God's love zone, which is not the same place. I don't know if you realize that or not today. But how to know if you're actually loving like Jesus is to ask yourself the question, do I feel like I'm being stretched out of my comfort zone to help others? Because if you don't feel like that, like, and I don't often, I have to ask myself, am I doing what I should be doing? Now, I did just come back from the Philippines a couple weeks ago, which stretches me way out of my comfort zone. But sometimes we're stretched out of our comfort zone just being in our neighborhood. Do you think about the impact your life could have if you love like Jesus? Are you held back today? Are we held back because of fear? Most people don't 
share the love of Jesus, love others with his love because of fear of rejection, fear of refusal, fear of what people will think about them. And we get all, you know, my faith is personal, I'm not going to bother telling anybody. And I've said this before, like, your, 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 your relationship with Jesus is personal, but it's not private. you got to be telling people in a way that shows love and is attractive. And that's part of the beauty of, of God's love in our hearts. 1 John 4 says there's no fear in love. I love it. There's no fear in love because God's love removes all that fear. The only reason I'm going to stand up here this weekend and talk to you about what it could look like if we deploy on our city, on our region, is because I know God's love removes fear. That you can go ahead and live out of your comfort zone a little bit radical, a little bit crazy, become one of those people, not a Bible thumper, because we don't need Bible thumpers. We need people that love Jesus and truly love others. I love the way this passage of Scripture ends, though, because it says in verse 21, he's given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Why do I bring this up this weekend? Because I know a whole lot of people who say they love God. They don't really like people at all. They don't really love their brother and sister at all. Now, I have kids. And uh, if you have siblings or if you have kids, I've learned a lot about loving your brother and sister, that it means trying to kill them. It's amazing. Like, our kids, you know, they're, they're, they're like calling each other every name in the book and screaming at each other. Not really every name in the book because they don't know every word that's in the book. And, and they're just, you know, they're, they're really going at it. And then all of a sudden, you know, I see my, 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 my baby girl just resting her head and sleeping on her older brother's shoulder. And I'm just like, I don't even understand how this happens. Like, I legitimately thought you were going to put each other in the hospital 10 minutes ago. And now you're just, so there's this amazing love-hate relationship. But as followers of Jesus, what, what, does, what does love look like? What does it look like to, to live this life of deploying? Jesus taught a parable that I want to talk through this weekend. To give us a picture, I've taught it before, I'll teach it again. I think it's one of the greatest parables that Jesus taught in helping us understand how we need to live on purpose. And it's one that challenges all of us because most of us here today, I believe, would say we're busy. How many of you, by show of hands, would say you're busy? If you don't have your, no, no, keep your hands up. This is really important. If you don't have your hands up, those of you with your hands up, you can just scan around you and look for somebody that doesn't have a hand up where you're like, I can have something for them to do before they leave <laughs> church today. Those are your helpers. That's, that's who you're looking for before you leave. The, right, so, so we're busy. Now, busyness is not a bad thing, in essence. It's that are we busy doing the right things? Are we busy doing the right things? Because we should be busy noticing people that need God's love all the time. That's really what Jesus starts to teach. It's called the parable of the good Samaritan, and we're going to walk through it this weekend. There was a guy that came and asked Jesus a question and, about what does it really mean to love you and to follow you, and he said, love God with all your heart and, and your neighbor as yourself, the greatest commandment. But then Jesus says this beginning in verse 30, and this is what I want us to walk through. He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Interesting note, you're always going up to Jerusalem. If you ever visit Israel, you're always going up to Jerusalem, no matter where you're coming from. For those of you that like interesting tidbits of theology, geography, there you go. It took me a while to get it when I was in Israel. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away. And he saw the man, sorry, he beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. That's bad. Make sure we're tracking here. This is Bible. We're reading the Bible. Verse 31. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, let's make that very practical and very real right now. A priest, we'll just take it into context for what we could today. We'll just call it a pastor, a, a ministry leader. We'll just say anybody who is a, a follower of Jesus Christ, a priest, walked on by this person who was there on the side of the road. So to a Levite, which would have been like another Christian, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, 
He came where the man was, and he saw him, and he took pity on him. He went and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. He put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now, significant, if you don't notice this, is that it means he put the man on his own donkey. He would have walked himself now instead of riding and let this guy who was hurt ride. Really putting himself out both physically and financially. What else is really significant, if you've never studied this in the Bible before, is that Samaritans and Jews hated each other. And I mean hated each other. Talk about a racial divide like we can't imagine. I mean, it was like we want to kill each other all the time, period. And, and Jews thought it would be absolutely terrible to have a Samaritan touch them, talk to them, almost anything. They would just do everything they could to avoid them. Yet here's a guy who knows that about this person. Like he knows if this person's healthy, they probably want to kill me. And he goes, I think I'll help them. Now, why is that so interesting? Well, the pastor just walked right by. The Christian just walked right by. But the non-believer stopped, stopped to help. I've heard it said before that in our world today, people find it very hard to tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Do you think that's true of your life? Do you think that's true of your life? I hope that you have friends who are Christians, and I hope that you have friends who are not. Are there differences in your lives? I pray that there is. But many would say there's really not. And a parable like this, I think, would give us a great example of how perhaps it wouldn't seem different. He continued, just to give you the verse, 35, the next day, this, this Samaritan, it says, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense. Then Jesus asked this question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? Could we shout that word out? Neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of the robbers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, now you go and do likewise. Who is your neighbor? Well, anybody that's in need that we come into contact with. And then you know what we say? Well, there's so many needs, it could just be overwhelming. And Jesus, just stop with the one thing that you can do right now. Just stop with the one thing that help the one person you can right now. Even this weekend before you leave church, there's somebody here that needs you to help them with an encouraging word. Even as you leave here today and you, you drive to wherever you're going, probably eat a delicious meal, um, you're hungry. <laughs> a little bit hungry. It's good good. There'll be somebody that needs you just to love them. One pastor says, I've never met a Christian who was not able to craft the most unbelievable excuse for why they didn't help someone. That's a craft, isn't it? Making excuses. Here's what I think. I think every one of us here today and I believe this. I believe every person here today would say, I would stop and help the person. I would stop and help the person. If you're here today and you would say, I wouldn't, I would just keep going by and you know that about yourself, you're probably just more honest when you're with yourself than most of us. Because <laughs> I believe every one of us would say we would stop and help them. But let me ask you a question. Do you even know your own neighbor's name? Do you even know your neighbor's name? We think we would do something dramatic to help somebody, yet in our day-to-day -day lives, we so often don't just do the basic things to connect with people. We so often don't just do the basic things to help even know what some person might actually need. Learning your neighbor's first name is a great first step to deploying on Hampton Roads with a month of love. I mean that. Some of you are like, oh man, I've been living here 10 years. It means you get to go from, hey man, <laughs> to hey William. 
You can actually say, how are you doing, William? Then that keeps progressing. And you could say, hey, William, there's something in my garage. Could you come help me for a quick second? You could keep progressing to where you could say, hey, William, I saw your son moved back in, and he's 47. How's that going? <laughs> People who study crime statistics say that where neighbors know each other on a first-name basis, crime rates are 60% lower. Let's deploy on Hampton Roads with love. And we're like, I'm going to help all the people who, who have empty stomachs. Good, we need to do that. Let's get to know people also. Let's get to know. See, we don't like to think this, but God has every one of us in the neighborhood, in the apartment complex, on the street we're in for a reason. Like for a reason. And it's... It, no, no question, it's for a period of time. Some of you, it may be a lifetime. Some of you, it may be for a month. Whatever it is, it is on purpose while you live there. It is on purpose. Some of you want to move, and the reason you, you haven't been able to move is because you haven't fulfilled God's purpose for while you're at, why you are where you're at. And you need to say, God, how am I supposed to love my neighbors? How am I supposed to work this out? And he might say to some of you, get to know their name. I know Megan and I, we, we, we've talked about about moving and things because we happen to have lived in, in our own home now longer than we've ever lived anywhere before in our lives. And, and my wife, who gets this concept better than anybody I know, we talk about moving, and here's what she said to me, and it, it really grabbed my heart. She said, my challenge with moving is I just want to make sure we've done everything we're supposed to do for our neighbors. Because every one of us have the ability to bring so much transformation because we're filled with that John 13 love that Jesus said, others will know me by the way you love. It's that personal touch that so many people need. It's that personal touch that God's asked you to give to others. You drive by a lot of houses today coming to church. Many of you drove by dozens, if not hundreds of homes. Do you know inside of those homes, we can't imagine the gamut of things that are going on. And I think God would just say, would you personally connect with one to show them I love them? If you're taking notes, write this down. Personal touch always trumps programs. Personal touch always trumps programs. Why do I say that? Well, here's why. Because I, I know sometimes we have this feeling that somebody else will take care of the problem. Have you ever felt like that? Whatever the problem is, somebody... Somebody else will take care of that. And that's a good feeling because that way you don't have to carry any stress about it. But there is not an answer to the problem of not having the love of Jesus other than people connecting with other people with the love of Jesus. The answer to people walking out of, out of, out of poverty is not a program. It's people getting a personal touch that does include filling their belly but also with the love and hope of Jesus. It's why government programs never lead to transformation. It's why church programs never lead to transformation. It's personal touch with the love and hope of Jesus that leads to complete transformation. It's that personal touch. And you get personal touch. It gives you that, that kind of that warm feeling inside, you know, when you're connected. It's why you like to go to some of the places you go, some of the restaurants and things. You'll go somewhere, and people do kind of an, an extra effort to give you that personal touch. It, have, you ever, have you ever gone to eat at, at one of my favorite restaurants? It's called Moe's. <laughs> Welcome to Moe's. Welcome to Moe's, and I just I feel like I'm home, right? Welcome to Moe's. Hey, welcome to Moe's. My kids and I, we go there sometimes, and I'll take all my kids there by myself, really because I want to entertain other people that are there. And, um, <laughs> and, and so we'll walk in, and sometimes we get it out before the guy behind the counter, which is really fun because then they're like, what? <laughs> but, but, you know, I know that, and if you've been to Moe's, you remember that. And you know what it is? That's a, it's like this, it's kind of different. It's weird. It's a personal, it's a personal, it makes you think, hey, they, they're glad that I'm here. 
you're glad that I'm here. Are there people in your life that you're connecting with in that way? Are you stepping out of your comfort zone to connect? You know, I was in the Philippines two weeks ago, and we were at an orphanage one day. And I think about personal touch and just watching our team hold babies and young people. Going, you know what is great that, that food is being brought for these kids? It's great that, that there's an actual home for them to stay in. But do you know what is, is changing them and filling them the most right now? It's because they are legitimately being touched by, by a, a, a grandparent, given that hug that they wouldn't otherwise have, saying God loves you and he has a great plan for your life. It'll change those kids. It'll change those kids. And Jesus is asking us, to live on purpose with his love. He gave us this command, and if you've studied the Bible before, you've heard this in Matthew 28. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus, before he left the earth, he goes, get ready, because if you're my follower, I have given you All you need to go change this world with the love and hope of Jesus. If you're taking notes, write that down. I've been given all I need. In order for us to deploy on Hampton Roads, we have been given all we need. You've been given all you need. And I want you to get in your heart today what I said earlier, that if you're hurting, helping someone else be healed, I believe will heal your hurt. You've been given all you need. Do you know what it means to have the authority of Jesus? It means that you can heal sick people. That's what it means. He, he uses terminology in some places, like cast out demons. Now, I don't know if you grew up in church, and that might weird you out if you, if you hear anything like that, or it might make you think of crazy snake handlers. I really don't know what it makes you think of if you hear that. But what he's simply saying is that nothing is impossible for Jesus. Nothing is impossible. And the devil is real, and he attacks people, and he attacks their minds, and he'll play games with them. And Jesus says, I've given you the authority to tell anything that's attacking somebody else to leave in Jesus' name. He says, I've given you the authority to lay hands on sick people and see them be healed. And so when we deploy on our city this month, yes, we're going to fill some empty bellies. We're going to help people with wisdom to save their marriages. But I'm saying we're going to pray some bold prayers and watch God work incredible miracles because that's who he is. And Jesus declared, I've given you all you need. 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 He said, you're the light of the world. That's what he says about you and I. Jesus tells his followers, you should light up people's lives. I want to be a person that lights up others' lives. I want to be a person that encourages the heck out of others. Because no matter what we're walking through, greater things are yet to come. That's why we sing that song this weekend. Because we're a church who believes the best is yet to come. We believe that. And we believe specifically God has a call on us over Hampton Roads. And to live out, I believe, what Matthew chapter 5 says. I love the message translation. It says, here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God's not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Shine. What's that thing people that work out say? I, I don't sweat, I sparkle. That's not what Jesus is talking about right here. You should shower before you go tell people about Jesus after you work out. Just want it, it's important as a church that we keep it very real. He says, keep open house, be generous with your lives. Here's what I love, this ending part and why I love this translation. He says, by opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up to God with this generous Father in heaven. When we open up to others, it will prompt them to open up to God. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus because somebody opened their life up to you. 
And God's asking us to deploy on our city and open our lives up to others, to be generous with our time, to make a difference. Every single one of us, your bulletins this weekend, there's a lot of ways to serve just in the day-to-day common stuff. But every single one of us should try to stretch ourselves more this month of March than we ever have before. To say, I want to I wanna open myself up to, to help somebody, to serve somebody, to love somebody. On our website, you can see a ton of different places to sign up and ways to serve. Sign up. Sign up and give away what Jesus has given you. That's what I'm asking us to do. Jesus says to all of us, I've given you all that you need in Matthew 28. And now, I believe he would say to us, we must go give it away. We must go give it away. That's why he says in 1 John 3, verse 18, I love this verse. It says, dear children, let's not merely say we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. Let's show the truth by our actions. Do our actions show that we love people? Because I could preach a message about going out and loving people, which a message like this, it isn't as exciting for you as other messages. Because it means this whole point of this message this weekend is about us going out and loving people. And you're like, well, gosh, I'm really going to have to do something if I want this to affect my life. <laughs> I like it better when Pastor Michael is just like, Jesus loves me and he's going to heal me and make my life all better. <laughs> and he's telling me how I need to get out there and do stuff. Yeah. Because I know that you want God's best for your life. Even if you're not yet a Christian, the fact that you're here means to some level you believe in God or you're thinking about believing in God, which is enough to say, you'd say, if he's real, I want his best. And I, I, I feel this burning urge inside of me whenever I think about this to go, do my actions really show others that I love God and love them? And I mean, you're an amazing church, hear me. You're an amazing church. We have so much favor with God and with with people in our city already. People call our church from multiple organizations, multiple city leaders, call our church and ask for help because they know the people of Community Church care about others and love others, and we do this. We do this. I'm saying let's go to a whole nother level here today. Let's go to a whole nother level here today. Let's let, let's let our actions truly show how much we've been filled with God's love and love others. See, when God's love changes your heart, there's always an action that shows it. There's always an action that shows God's love has changed your heart. And it's why at the end of every one of our services, I lead us into a prayer, some sort, to give people an opportunity to put to action what I hope God has done in your heart. Many here today would say, yeah, I love God. Have you done an action to prove that to him? Now, he doesn't need that, but it really just shows yourself what's actually happened inside. And so I'm going to ask us right now across this room to close our eyes. And as you sit here right now, as you watch online right now, if you would say that, if you would say that you've kind of loved God or you've thought about it, but, but you don't know that you've ever... You don't know that you've ever prayed to say, Jesus, I'm giving you my life. You don't know that you've ever begun to really step into his plan. I'm going to lead us in a prayer that some of you, I believe, will pray this for the first time. Maybe some of you for the first time in a long time. And I'm just going to ask that we would pray this prayer together. And if you do pray it for the first time or first time in a long time, to tell us, let us know on your connection card and drop it off before we leave at the end of service. But if you're here today and you would say that God... uh, has changed your heart and you want to declare it, maybe 
for the first time, but I'm telling you, I declare this regularly. Just repeat these words after me across this room. It goes like this. Say, Father, I love you. Thank you for loving me. Today, I put my faith in you. Today, I've decided I'm not living for myself. I'm living for you. And I believe your best is coming my way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we shout and clap?